Okay, uh, let's let's begin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the postdoc quest series. And today we have Dr. Dimitri with us. And uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Dimitri. Uh, Dr. Dimitri is currently a research associate at the University of Texas at Austin. And is working with Dr. Deji Akinwande. Is part of the Microelectronics Research Center and the uh, EC department at UT Austin. So he is currently working on the real life applications of 2D materials such as graphene, MOS2, and others in the field of bioelectronics, neuroprocesses, soft tissue, and epidermal electronics. Within the scope of the recent pandemic, Dr. Dimitri has shifted his focus towards building graphene-based biosensor targeted for COVID-19 virus detection. He finished his PhD work in 2017 at the Institute of Bioelectronics Research Center, Zurich, Germany working on graphene-based devices for neuroprocesses and interaction neuron cells and devices uh, and uh, general bioelectronics. Uh, Dimitri is a recipient of prestigious EMM Nano Scholarship and performed his uh, master's study in KU Leuven and Chalmers University with majors in nanoelectronics. Before finding his way into bioelectronics, uh, Dimitri has completed his BSc and MSc in Moscow National Research University of electronic technology at the Department of Quantum Physics and Nanoelectronics with a major in micro and nanoelectronics. Welcome, uh, Dimitri. All right, well, nice. Thank you. Thank you for introduction, Teju. That was a, <laughs> a, a very lengthy one. It could have been a little bit shorter, no problem. Thank you. Yes, so uh, yeah, I guess we can take it a little bit easier today since uh, we have just been almost frozen to death here in Texas. So everyone is just thawing out a little bit. So, and uh, feel free to stop me, raise questions or re raise your hands and ask your questions anytime during the presentation. So I'll be happy to just rather have a discussion than just talk for one hour straight. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to discuss something. And uh, well, I mean, the talk and today's meeting is rather on the postdoc quest, right? So I would start a little bit uh, on the introduction of myself once again, about my quest, about my path, then a little bit on research. And I would just come to, oh, you know, maybe some, some advice for grad students and uh, in general students from my perspective. So, and also my talk is cited like, towards two-dimensional humans, of course, you would say, well, how come we are two-dimensional? So I'd say, of course, humans are not two-dimensional. So that's, that's, that's the, uh, of course, an obvious lie. We're not really two-dimensional. So we're really nicely three-dimensional as a humans. Uh, but uh, we are really highly, we, we're highly biocompatible, highly uh, compatible with 2D materials. And uh, the 2D materials has, a, like, has, a, has been a huge research field uh, starting from like 2006, 2010. Uh, and the, the last de decade has been really attracted a lot of research attention, mostly in physics and electronics, maybe in chemistry, but uh, the translation into all bioelectronics and human healthcare uh, use of all those 2D materials for those healthcare and uh, bioelectronic applications is really immense. And uh, today I hope to just show you just, just a few of those applications that I have been working myself. And uh, so to start with, once again, with my, my pathways uh, about myself. So I am from a really small town somewhere in the middle of Russia. And I did my PhD, sorry, I did my bachelor and master uh, thesis first in Moscow, in Zelenograd, actually. So it's like, it's, it's a part of Moscow, not really exactly Moscow. Uh, it's like, you know, like Alaska in the US. I will show the details of that. After that, I moved to K11, to Belgium. So uh, where I did one year of my Erasmus Mundus master, then I went to Chalmers, to Sweden, up north, never froze there, not as... It's never been as freezing in my apartment there or in Russia as, 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 it, as it has been in Texas this week. And after that, I moved to Fortune Centrum Ulik. So the word that Teja had troubles pronouncing, uh, <laughs> I can't blame him. Um, so it's a Fortune Centrum stands for Research Centrum Ulik. 
And after that, uh, you know, just I just moved to to the U.S. to Texas. And let's just go, you know, maybe step by step by uh, some some of those steps. So the first step for me was studying in uh, Moscow Institute of Electronic Technology in Zelenograd, uh, which is officially Moscow just because it was a close town outside of Moscow. Like it's like I don't know, 50 kilometers probably outside of Moscow. It has been a closed city in Soviet Union. And uh, after that, it's of course not closed city anymore these days. Uh, and it was considered like a Silicon Valley of Russia. Uh, just because there was a lot of uh, microelectronics, wouldn't call nanoelectronics, but it was a lot of microelectronics research until the Soviet Union fell apart. After that, uh, there was no funding for science, there was almost no money, there was no way to buy equipment. So, of course, like the, uh, if you consider that a race, the race has been lost on our side there. And it, it's a pretty beautiful city and like it's all green. It's like it's like a student town. So if you ever be there, let me know. It's, it, just feel free to visit there. And so my first major was like quantum physics, theoretical physics, a lot of that, a lot of nanoelectronics. It was kind of, I wouldn't say boring. Uh, it's of course interesting, uh, but it probably wasn't exactly what I, I was looking for. And uh, this is, these are the conditions, of course, I mean, the, the picture is terrible, but those are pretty much the conditions. This is the dimensions of a room where typically three to four people would live at. So that's like a, that's like a dormitory uh, that uh, we'll live in, in for like four years. Um, after that, as uh, Teji mentioned, I uh, applied and I got this Erasmus Mundus master program uh, that is uh, in the heart of Europe. So it actually consists of many universities and like the, the core university is KU Leuven in Belgium. So like uh, they accept people from different backgrounds from like physics, material science, biotech, chemistry. So they kind of disregard exactly your background and then you get all like different profiles from what you what you want to study. And then for the second year, you go to university where you want to sort of have your uh, master's degree at. And uh, this, I think from a few years ago, they added Barcelona. We didn't have Barcelona as a choice. Uh, but so right now it's, there's Dresden, Grenoble, Barcelona and Chalmers, depending on your, uh, uh, sort of specialization option. Like you, you can study biophysics, biotechnology, nanoelectronics, quantum computing. So if you are just, you know, undergrad and uh, you want to just go for a master program in Europe in nanoelectronics, nanobioelectronics, nanotechnology, that's a fantastic opportunity. I highly recommend and you know, just feel free to drop me a mail if you're interested in it. I'll be happy to help. Um, yeah, just a few pictures. Of course, Leuven is amazing city. A lot of beer, a lot of beer, a lot of beer. Uh, it, it also has IMEC, uh, which is a huge microelectronics center, and it's highly interconnected with uh, uh, with the with the university. And so, actually, the picture on top. It's uh, so this is like one quarter of a old square in the middle of the town back to the beer so uh, there's there's probably like 10 different bars just on this this side of the street and there are four sides of the square so there are like 40 to 50 different bars just like in in in, in a single place so Leuven is really just an amazing place feel free to visit then i went to chalmers for my uh so that's in sweden for my uh nano electronic specialization so still was a lot of electronics quantum physics uh, that's where, well, also in, in my, uh, in Leuven, I also started to work with graphene and 2D materials that was already fascinating. But I, you know, I never kind of, I never considered, I never knew that I would move to like bioelectronics or biosciences. So like, you know, uh, in, in, into that direction until I just got to a, there was some sort of student conference. I think it was in Germany, somewhere in Erlangen. And there where I saw a poster where a group, uh, I think for Jose Garrido, so some student from Jose Garrido was presenting their poster of a neuronal cells sitting on top of a graphene transistor and they were able to measure electrical potential of neuronal cells. 
and you know to me this is just sort of clicked i was like that's cool so like this is something i want to i want to try and that was somehow that was very fast so like i found two groups in europe who was working on that i wrote to both of them one of them had an opening and three months later i just started working in portion center from julie which is a research center in the middle of nothing it is in the middle of a forest so you can see like even on this map there is a lot of trees but whatever is outside whatever is white you can consider a forest so it's it's it is literally in the middle of forest it's a it's a tiny town and uh, but the position is actually pretty good so it is nearby Aachen, Cologne, Bonn, Dusseldorf so like if you imagine this part of Germany that is also close to uh, Belgium and Netherlands and France so a lot of sort of travel opportunities and you know, explore Europe. But uh, from the research perspective, that is also really, again, this is like a huge research institute, right? So uh, people weren't doing courses, people were not doing, taking studies or lectures, right? They were coming to work, they were coming at you know, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and you were doing research work, right? So research 100%. And there are many institutes, many universities, sorry, many institutes and sub-research institutes that were doing uh, all sorts of different uh, research activity. And uh, our institute I was uh, involved at was Institute of Complex Systems, uh, Institute of Bioelectronics. And uh, th this is the sort of uh, research that we've been doing like for in biosensing, neuroelectronics, uh, and that was sort of pretty interesting that even me from my electronics background, I was able to, you know, mainly focus on fabrication of devices, doing some physics, uh, electrical characterization, but then also grasping information from the bio side, from the neuro side, so like from how to go to neurons, how to interface with cells. And it actually evolved very nicely. So like the PhD is, is a good time to somehow switch your, um, research and knowledge, uh, you, you can switch that substantially. In my opinion. So that's it with, you know, maybe with the background story, let's get a little bit to science. I hope to not bore you too much. If you learn something, that's fantastic. I'll be happy to, if you learn something today. So bioelectronics, right? So of course we all know what biology is, what are the bio elements are, we all know what electronics is, we know, all know what are the boards, microchips, your phones, you have the supercomputers, antennas, batteries. We all have those elements, right? And we all, we all are bio humans, right? There are DNAs, there are tissues, and there is so much difference between them, right? So electronics is hard, biology is soft. It's rigid, biology is elastic. It's, uh, you know, biology is evolving, but we can program electronics. And uh, there is so much difference, uh, let's say in the, in the performance of the brain, uh, like even the highest, the best supercomputers so far, they maybe outperform or like maybe on par in terms of performance of the amount of computational power they can do, but the way how much of the power they consume to sort of uh, to be even with the human brain is in, there is where immense difference is right now so and of course people have always been very eager and interested to sort of combine those two right or to learn how to do bioelectronic interface how to learn biology using electronics how to build skin inspired human inspired nature inspired electronic elements right and if you look just a little bit back to like 1700s uh, there is your probably the father of all the of the bioelectronics is luigi galvano right so like he connected a few connected the battery to a frog leg and just by applying the potential it was moving so that was probably one of the first bioelectronic experiments you can you can think of uh, the fast forward scroll, scrolling to modern days. I'm sorry, there will be no audio right now. It, uh, it's, uh, well, there's no audio, unfortunately. Uh, but he's just saying how awesome neuroscientist he is and uh, they were doing uh, um, 
neural interfaces, so those are Utah, I believe Utah microelectrode rays that can be implanted into the brain, like uh, right in. Uh, there's, uh, of course, there are some wires. Of course, it's 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 not very comfortable, but it it, wor it is still worth it. All the going through all the surgery, for many people like these people like on a wheelchair, wheelchair or people who cannot control, who even do not have arms, for example, right, or who have some cerebral uh, problems with the brain, they cannot control their limbs, so they can implant those electrodes, perform a bunch of stimulation and. and uh, and bi-directional communication and people just by thinking of, of course, I believe to make this video, it, it took this person like you know, months of training, but like just by thinking of it, she, she is able to move this robotic arm to just fit herself. I think that's that's just amazing of uh, example of what, of what it can achieve with this really terribly, uh, terrible electronics that we have right now, right? So let's, uh, let's go next. So this is just some of the images of those uh, implantable electrode arrays. Right? So like, it, these are literally needles that go inside of your brain tissue. So like imagine like you would have your brains open and you just have a hammer and you like put up, you like almost hammering nails inside of your brain. That's pretty much what's happening. So obviously those implants as, as, as long as they work, they work for a short time, but they're not perfect. They're far from perfect. And uh, there, there should be ways to improve those implants. And this is where, in my opinion, graphene and all uh, 2D materials come along. So unlike modern electronics on like silicon or like, you know, hard metals and everything, Graphene is soft, it's elastic. At the same time, it's strong. It is very thin, but it's flexible and biocompatible. So if you build the electronics out of fully 2D materials that is, you know, atomically thin, if you get several nanometers thin, it can fully stay inside your brain, inside your tissue, inside your body for years, for tens of years, maybe even for hundreds of years without the body realizing there is something foreign inside, right? So you can literally build an interface, of course, in some future, you can literally build an interface that is uh, completely imperceptible for you while it is able to record, let's say your thoughts, or maybe in the future, you can even claim that it can stimulate your brain so it can make you think of something. Well, you can only dream of whatever is possible. Um, of course, research-wise, you have to start, uh, you have to go step by step, right? So you can't jump directly to the flying ships uh, inside of your brain and dreaming about uh, whatever is possible. So the first step that we've started is uh, uh, building an array of graphene field effect transistors and growing neuronal cells on top or some sort of cells. And this is actually just, this is a fake pseudo colored ACM image of neuronal cells. So this is a cell and this are neurons. Oh, okay, there's some lag. So there is a cell and there are some neurons that are you know, growing on top of the surface. And there will be, you know, there is a graphene channel underneath. And when the cell produces an action potential, you can record that by your graphene channel. And uh, here are just uh, some of the results of the experiments with different tissues. So. First, we just put a, we took literally a heart of a of a mice, I believe, embryonic heart, and you know just put it on, on top of the chip, and you know heart the cell was HL1 cardiac cells. They built beat similar like to your heart, right? So like every second you probably have a beat, and this is what you see. So you have those uh, potentials, like you have those spikes in uh, electrical recordings. You can do the same with neuronal cells, uh, but the, of course the uh, potential wise, the amplitude of those neuronal potentials are usually lower. So it is much more complicated to record the neuronal cell uh, action potentials uh, uh, nicely. Then we also built uh, graphene microelectrode arrays. Those are much simpler devices. So while for a field effect transistor, you need two electrodes, right? You need source, drain, you need a gate, and you have a cell, so you have to drive some current through. Uh, Microelectrode arrays are much simpler devices. So it's, it's a literally like a passive electrode that is there. 
So like there is graphene, there is persuasion opening, and there are cells. So on, on this figure, you can see cells growing on top of the chip. And similar to the FETs, when they beat, when they produce an action potential, you can passively record that. And uh, you can study the propagation of those action potentials. So you can uh, literally translate that into research of maybe um, um, like drug studies, for example, right? You can study how a certain drug affects your cells in vitro, like without needing to do this research in actual human beings, for example. Um, and the same you can do with neuronal cells. So, and uh, this is what we've done. So we've grown a bunch of different neurons. So this, the, I will just show a few images. So these are different densities of neuronal cells. So like you can probably see this neuronal cells uh, grown on top of the microelectrode arrays uh, with different densities, right? Because well, those are living organisms. You can't really, you can't really tell those organisms to, 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 to grow, to do exactly what you want. They always behave a little bit differently. So you can grow those cells in different ways and you record those action potentials in a different way. So think of those as your brain performing different operations, right? Depending on what you think of, the response will be obviously different and the way you think of it is different. And very nicely is that you can actually transform that research. So everything uh, what was done in, the, in, this, in this research so far was done on rigid substrate still, right? It doesn't add up to the flexible and implantable research so far, but you can do it on flexible substrate. This is what we have here. And this is very interesting. So this is one of those substrate that was, you know, just to show how robust that is. So you can have that flexible substrate with graphene microelectrodes. You can literally just crumple it completely to like a, you know, a, a bowl. And then afterwards still, you know, uncrumple it, bond, you can encapsulate to the chip, grow cells on top of it and you can measure cells. So it is that robust, uh, that versatile. So you can use it for numerous uh, studies. And uh, we went a little bit forward there and uh, we've been also working on uh, implantable electrodes, but I won't go there uh, today. And actually I will, yeah, that's, that's a good timing. Um, I will go to part two, so uh, on electronic tattoos, unless you have questions on part one, actually. Yeah, Dimitri, I just have a quick question. So, yeah. so I see that there are a lot of electrodes. So why do you need so many uh, electrodes? Is there... Right, right. Yeah, good question, actually. So if you just record just one, it is, uh, it is not that interesting, right? So you can know that it is, it, it is alive or not. So like if you just measure, let's say, a single cell, single location of the cell, doesn't give you much information. So like if you want to, you, you might want to study propagation, right? You want to study communication. What you can also do, like it's, you, you would usually have, uh, let me go back, uh, it would, the typical uh, for us would be 64, so it's eight by eight. Mm -hmm. And you can usually, you can actually use one of those devices to stimulate the cells. So not just measure, but you can stimulate the cell, let's say here, and then you can see how those uh, propagation, how those section potentials change in other locations. Right. So you can establish some sort of bi-directional communication with the cells. Okay, okay. And and having these electrodes, do so so the growth does not happen on the electrodes. I mean, do the it it happens other... on the electrodes. So uh, and the growing neurons, it's it's a slow process, and it, it usually happens for over like three weeks. So the, you you need to plan in advance and like research wise, experiment wise, it's it's a slow process. It's like working with all the living organisms. It's uh, much different for. For us, people with electronic backgrounds, with people who do clean room, right? It's it, it's a completely different world, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. Now let's go to graphene tattoos. Well, electronic tattoos. There is also a very interesting topic. So this is actually what I am working at right now here in UT Austin. And uh, you, know, you know, if you think of electronic tattoos, that's actually what you might think of, right? So like this electronic tattoos on the skin or this kind of electronic tattoos you might be thinking of when you hear those words, electronic tattoos. 
uh, what we do is actually this kind of electronic tattoos that are literally uh, atomically thin. They are electrically conductive. They are transparent optically. So you can see those pictures, they're transparent. They're really adhesive to the skin and they are uh, like, if you can actually see this image really nicely. So it really adheres to like all those micro cavities to all the microstructure of the skin. So it established the most like very excellent connection to the skin. Uh, while you can uh, record a whole bunch of uh, electro electrical potentials from your from the human skin, and uh, of course the first question is why, right? So like why would you want to do that, and like what exactly would you want to measure? And of course uh, there are a bunch of electrophysiology signals like electrocardiogram, electro encephalogram right from the brain, you can measure muscle potentials. And uh, by measuring muscles, you can also, uh, like the next step would be to build some robotic interfaces. And this is just this is just scratching the surface, what's possible there, right? So there are of course all sorts of fitness tracking. There are interfaces for human with uh, disabilities, for example, that they can uh, you know, robotically control the wheelchair again. Uh, but what is very, I believe the most important or what is very important these days, and this is where research in both sort of electronics and solid electronics uh, perspective, and also from IT perspective is going to, is connecting the sensors and big data in order to build preventive care. So the, the, the health care that we have right now is sort of, Okay, it hurts. I'm going to the doctor. You go to the doctor, you say it hurts, and you're like, okay, you got a disease. And the doctor said the doctor checks you, right? They say you got a disease and you need to do surgery. And you're like, okay, well, that's that that's terrible, right? And there is no way to prevent it. But what if by you know all this daily fitness monitoring, monitoring your electrocardiogram, monitoring your sweat biopotential monitoring your uh, all sorts of biopotentials you can build up a big database that will say if this persists there is a high chance that you will have uh, high blood pressure in 10 years and you know you, you just so we need to cut first to collect all this information and this is i believe what is happening right now and this is where graphene tattoos can also be very helpful so you need to build those algorithms and you need to build this database that later on can tell you okay you've been drinking too much beer in the last week most probably you won't feel well in, in the next few days well okay that i can i, I know that myself uh without the algorithms telling me that uh, but there are, of course, some other more deep understanding of the, of the disease development that can be done in uh, building this preventive care is really important. And uh, yeah, let's just go and again, let's look a little bit in the past. And this is the first electrocardiogram developed in 1903 by William Eindhoven. And they actually got a Nobel Prize for this uh, for, the, for this for this device. So you can see how uh, uncomfy was that. Like you would have to put your right hand, uh, sorry, right uh, right leg, both hands into salty conductive water, and you run this huge machinery just to measure your electrocardiogram. These days we can just measure it with the graphene tattoos. Like you just put them on the chest. You have a really tiny piece of electronics. Literally all the experiments I'm going to show today with graphene tattoos. I should have. Yeah, I don't have it at home, but it's literally like like that large piece of electronics that is even uh, that is operational via Bluetooth these days. And you can just run it uh, to, to, to get electrocardiogram, electromyogram, electroencephalogram. So the, the research went really high that uh, that way that you can do all this research at home by yourself. Um, so 
these are just some of the data that we have measured with graphene tattoos, uh, the electrocardiogram, electromyogram, which are your muscle movements, right? So like when you contract muscles, there are some electrical potentials happening uh, within the uh, muscle cells and those, those you, you can record that. And this is also very interesting that uh, you can, by having those uh, electromyogram sensors, you can build the uh, robotic interfaces. And you might have, might have seen these people with robotic arms. That would, it, it would be a very uh, low, some people would just have, you know, probably have some problem with the arm. And they would just have a two sensors just placed uh, on the edges of the arm. And by the way you do, you, you have to do some binary operations, like, you know, imagine moving your hand up, up, down, down. The hand performs different uh, operations. So that's very, still very sort of the, this research in its infancy. And there are really cool research directions there that you can do if you have a really, maybe more dense interface of those, so, uh, myogram sensors that you can build a more precise uh, robotic arms, for example. Uh, you can also, with the same graphene tattoos, you can measure temperature. That's what you can see over here on A and B, so that you can you can measure the, the change in temperature. This is while wearing on skin. You can also measure hydration of the skin and uh, hydration of the environment, mainly on the skin. That's more important. And uh, you might think it's maybe not important for you, right? Uh, you know, why would you be interested in measuring hydration of the skin? But imagine uh, for army applications, for soldiers, that would already have like, uh, you know, 20 kilos of equipment on them. So uh, you wouldn't want to add another half a kilo of, you know, temperature sensor, which would be messy. But if you can have those tattoos, you know, that would measure hydration and temperature of a soldier, uh, that's an amazing application. And that's uh, what people are aiming at these days as well. And making these graphene tattoos, I'll just show a few figures today. Uh, making them is actually very simple and very easy. And they are literally made as graphene tattoos, like temporary graphene tattoos, like you had them like you kid. So this is a temporary tattoo paper. This is just some of the shapes that you can do. And you literally just put it on the skin. There, there you see the, the long horn that's uh, placed on the skin. And uh, uh, it is conductive and it's electrically useful. Uh, this is just some more pictures. And there is the video of, uh, you know, how you place the graphene tattoos. Once again, there is no uh, audio, but there is no audio and video anyway. Um, we can skip that. This is just you know details on how to measure the how to perform the electrical measurements. But there is already you see one tattoo is already placed there. Now there will be a detailed video of how you place the second tattoo. So you just place this. So this is a temporary tattoo paper that is placed on the skin with graphene facing down. You just apply a little bit of pressure and then just start. You well you make it wet. You know like this temporary tattoo paper. You have to put it on, make it wet and you just can remove it. To make sure you, you don't just you know quickly remove it, you just slide it off. And this is what we do. You just carefully slide it off. Let's fast forward. There you go. So you just slide it off and this graphene tattoo stays on it. And you can do as many as you like. So here it's just transfer two. I believe this should be video next of where exactly, the, where we can transfer up to eight, 10, 20, depending on the application that you're interested in. Uh, you can transfer as many tattoos as you like. Um, okay. And uh, just, okay, I will just show a few, so some more scientific details if you're interested in. Um, a monolayer graphene tattoo is what we have started with, but what we've seen is that a monolayer graphene tattoo is not that uh, amazing uh, in performance sustaining the electrical qualities sample to sample. So you would, because it's a monolayer, there could be crack, there could be a small uh, problem, the small grain problem maybe in this uh, in this graphene, uh, just a small, pro, small crack there. And it will destroy all the electrical properties of the whole device. What we do is we actually fabricate bilayer graphene tattoos. So we make a monolayer of the graphene, put it on another monolayer of graphene. So we don't grow a bilayer. 
but I put a monolayer of graphene on top of another monolayer of graphene. And that sort of reinforces the connection there and uh, the performance, as you can see. So here is a plot of impedance. So graphene to skin impedance on Y axis and sheet resistance of the device on uh, X axis. So obviously you would want your performance to be uh, in the left lower corner. And if you see all the monolayer graphenes, they're highlighted in red, they have the completely in the opposite. So they have high sheet resistance and uh, high impedance, which is not good. And they, what is most important, they have huge distribution. So look at this distribution of, this, of, the, of the samples. So it is not really useful. You never know what kind of device you get uh, when you start using it. When you do a bilayer, you, you get a much better sheet resistance. Of course, you can also see here, depending on supplier, supplier to supplier, there is some variability. Uh, but as long as you stick to one of the suppliers, you're, you're good. So we usually from, let's say from that moment forward, we usually go with bilayer graphene tattoos. Um, yeah, I won't bore you much with details here. And let's just show you a few cool images of how those graphene tattoos on wrist sustain all those movements mechanical movements, placing the water, like droning them in the water, uh, just, you know, locally put in the water. Okay, this is a slow more. So well, all those graphene tattoos, they sustain mechanical movements, water, and uh, they're pretty amazing in, in use. All right. And the next one, this is the most recent uh, piece of uh, research that we've been doing. This is another, there are two actually new recent 2D materials that we started to work with. Uh, they are PT acid tool, platinum the selenide and platinum the telluride. Very interesting, very promising 2D materials. So they are TMDs based on platinum. What they are interested in, why are they interested, is because you can grow them at low temperatures, at like down to 400 Celsius. You may say it's not that low, but A, it is low enough to be compatible with post CMOS process. So like you can have it at the back end of the line in the CMOS. So it is CMOS compatible, which is amazing. Uh, graphene is not, for example, MOS2 is not. Um, and second is uh, it is compatible to be grown directly on flexible polymers, which is what we've done here. And well, both PT acetyl and PTT2 have very different properties. So PTT2 is a much more metallic uh, 2D material. PT acetyl is, is sort of a semi-metallic. So it's similar to graphene when it's, it's in the monolayer state. Uh, but we almost never used a monolayer. It was almost always like some multi-layer graphene tattoos, multi-layer uh, 2D material, sorry, not graphene tattoos, multi-layer tattoos. So there were always multiple layers of those 2D materials. Um, and this is just, again, those images of uh, those uh, platinum TMD tattoos with PMMA support, similar to graphene. And uh, the most commonly what we've used is those Team, platinum TMG that was grown on captain for like, you know, directly grown on captain, but just uh, having platinum, uh, you do salinization, atelurization, you get, you get those uh, tattoos directly and just use them. What is very cool, I don't think I have that here actually, uh, but we, uh, I should have, but we had those tattoos on skin for 24 hours and even more counting. And I was able to measure resistance, measure impedance, and they were never going bad. So like, they are very robust, so you can measure them for days straight and they don't go bad. Performance-wise, PT acid tool, I must say, so they all outperform monolayer graphene, similar to what you've seen before. So monolayer graphene is of course not the best. Uh, they are, so the PT acid tool is on par with graphene to the bilayer graphene tattoos, but the PTT2 is uh, really much a much better conductor and uh, impedance uh, wise uh, tattoo compared to even bilayer graphene. So 
And similar to all those graphene tattoos, we perform those cardiograms, electromyograms, electroencephalograms, right? And you can place them here on your, on your forearm and just, you can close your eyes or try to meditate and you can record different uh, uh, level of electrical activity from your brain. This was very interesting. So this is actually the last scientific experiment I'm going to explain before we'll be wrapping up. So there is, uh, this is a so-called electrooculogram experiment. So you can place those tattoos on top of the, the bottom of your eye and on the left and on the side of your eyes. And when you look up and down and when you look left and right, your retina, retina and cornea there, because they misplaced, right? So you move your eyes up, down, left, right. They, uh, they, there is a, an extra potential difference built up. And you can record that. So you can have one tattoo here and here. And when you look up, that's what you see here. Uh, when you look up, you have a spike in this, uh, in this signal that you record between these two potentials. Then you look down, the spike goes the opposite direction. When you look left and right, you have a signal response at other electrodes at the other channel. And uh, that's, that's what, that's what you, can, you can see in uh, figure D, for example. If you look up, you only have spike here. When you, have, when you look right, you only have this spike. So of course there are some smaller spikes, but those are noise. They are removable. And very interestingly, you can actually look into like circular dimensions, uh, circular directions. So you can look up and then, you know, uh, clockwise. And all your uh, gazing, let's say, if when you look from 12 to nine, this looking direction is the same as you'll be looking left and down. So this can really be used to build, uh, you know, some imperceptible electrooculography device. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you can even combine it with uh, uh, 3D, virtual reality glasses, for example, right? So research and application opportunities, they are really, really immense. Well, that's it with the research part. So if you, and uh, I will, I have a few more slides on you know, postdoc quest part. So if you have questions on scientific parts, uh, that will be now. Okay, I guess that's no, but well, you can ask the, your questions at any time later on, so feel free. So back to the postdoc quest. I love this schematics, I love those drawings. So if you've seen it, uh, that's great. If you haven't seen it, uh, let me explain it. So of course it already has the comments. So, but, so imagine you have a circle that is your human knowledge. By the time, you know, you slowly go through elementary school, high school, you know, maybe you get a bachelor's degree, you slowly try to, you slowly grasp in some information of that experimental knowledge. So of, of the, so this is all human knowledge that exists, right? So you only get a little bit in the middle of that. So you get a specific, some speciality during your bachelor's degree, for example. Then during your master's degree, you select a direction where you want to go. And you keep going, you keep reading papers. So you get to the border of the human knowledge. So you know what is the border there. So you get to like the boundary, you focus there and you do your PhD. So you do your PhD is this border. This border is your PhD. So you're like, you're really pushing the boundary of your PhD for three to four years and you push it. So you finally, you complete the PhD and you like really, you push it slightly forward, but just because you've been working on that for the last three to four, five, six years, your world looks like that. So your world looks like this is what you've done. And uh, you know, this is, this is your world, but it's, you should really remember that in reality it isn't, right? So there's of course a big, big picture out there. So make sure to keep that in mind, uh, you know, in general. And just a few more advice. Uh, well, science is awesome, right? PhD is hard, usually hard for everyone. So uh, talk to people, you're not alone, right? It involves a lot of traveling usually, maybe not these days actually, all the COVID times are hard, but still 
that's fun, that's classy, then. And you get to be the first to discover something and that stands for a lot, right? So that's what maybe many of us are doing the research for, that's, that's what research uh, stands for, right? So like you are the, the first one to discover something amazing, that's cool. And of course, eventually you get the freedom, the sort of freedom for creativity, right? You get a freedom to do whatever you're interested in. You have the freedom to research or something. You really like those ancient Greek philosophers who would sit and think of something and you would do that. You usually have very flexible schedule, research directions, etc. On the negative side, of course, there are, it might impose really huge changes to your life. So like you would, Usually in science, you are you have to travel a lot. So like you have to travel between your bachelor place to master to postdoc another postdoc until you get your you know if you want to stay fully in academia until you get your assistant professorship, that may be also still not even final. So there are a lot of travel, which is uh, probably this kind of travel is maybe not exactly positive, and the other negative part i would say it's you always there is always more work it never gets easier there's always every time with every next step there is more work more responsibilities teaching grants writing research uh, so like there are way more responsibilities they be always growing and uh, just a few more advice on you know finding your place in the scientific world which is again it is huge and you might have to just go and search to what it clicks for you right what is what is something that you're really interested in so maybe whatever you're doing right now is not exactly your area that you want to continue on and you should be you shouldn't be afraid of switching it if you are interested in something else and for that you really should go to conferences and not just present your work but also you know to scout vent your ideas talk to people see what they work on, see what they think. Maybe the idea that you've been thinking for the last few months is something that have been discussed already and considered impossible, right? Um, and in general, just go get useful information of where the research is going to. It's like by reading the papers, you don't always grasp that, right? So like if you read a published article, if you see what has been published, this is old already in especially in our world so that's already old this is something that these students these people these researchers have been working maybe a year ago maybe this is probably something they conceived a few years ago they have just published now this paper is out now but it doesn't mean this is the state of the art the state of the art is between the lines of the publication so you need to look into outlook section look for reviews maybe and this is my, I think one of the best advice, you have to look into grants. You have to look into current grants. So like an NIH reporter, NSF award search, those are the most common ones. There are other award search uh, opportunities. Just go online, search for what is funded right now. So whatever, you know, a professor got the funding to work on this topic means the agency that was giving the money considered this topic interesting, considers this topic the future. That's also what the professors consider. So this will give you some more information of where the research is going to, let's say. Um, some other small pieces, of course, reach out to people, create your communities, do social network, and that's very important. Uh, always think of what you want to do next prepare yourselves if you want to go to industry that's totally fine you probably need to then do maybe more internships right less okay we can say less research but maybe you have to look for more internships look for startups so like prepare yourself way earlier um apply so this is very important i think so you need to apply you need to, but it's best to apply for all sorts of fellowships, scholarships, and awards. And it will be really amazing for you, for your CV. And if you just hesitate and just to, you don't want to bug your PI, don't worry. They will definitely be very, very happy to help. It also helps them. It also uh, makes them happy, believe me. And I think this is the last slide on all the advice. I think it's also very important. 
is you have to learn to handle your supervisors. So all this research that you are doing right now, I mean, you're the students, right? So you are, they supervise you, so they handle you, so, but it's, it's not a one-way street. You have to learn your supervisor, you have to find an approach to them, right? So like, uh, just an example that maybe some PIs might be okay if you go and take like, that before you pitch an idea to them, maybe you should do first a quick experiment or a rough uh, literature search before you even do that. Others might not. So you just have to sort of figure out what and what kind of person your QI is, right? So you have to find out what kind of people they are. Um, um, that's very important. Uh, you know, some people might be, you know, on my personal experience, you know, you might want, you might present the same idea, you might present this, bring the same discussion twice, and you just get different reaction from the PI. We have just completely different reaction. First time they say, uh, no, don't do that. Second time they say, wow, that's amazing. Why didn't you do, tell me that before? Right, so, and just try to think of, uh, of, I mean, also try to put yourself in the shoes of the PIs, right? They handle five, 10, maybe 30 more students like you. So they might be overwhelmed at that point. So like, don't get offended at them if they first say, I don't think it's worth it. If you're really interested, let's say in that idea, or if you want to keep pushing on that, go on and present that uh, to them another time, right? Um, just another example, let's say, Again, this is also a PI to PI issue, or your supervisor to supervisor issue. If your supervisor messages you, let's say at 1 a.m., 1 in the morning, it does not imply that you have to reply right away. Some people, believe me, some people think that that's the case. And this is just, uh, it, it goes the same as like working over weekends or working over time or you know, just doing those sort of, uh, work-life balance. So if, if this doesn't work for you, just go to be straightforward and tell them that it doesn't work for you. And they most probably 99% of the cases, they will be completely accepted for that. I just know that many people struggle with all this uh, dynamics and they will think if PI sends them a message at 1 a.m., they will expect the answer at the same time. So uh, just to finish up, just learn to handle and manage to handle your supervisor. And that's it. Thank you. And I'll be happy to have questions. Uh, Dimitri, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, on your uh, stuff that you're doing at UT Austin. So all the tattoos that you're making, you kind of hook them up with the wires. Is that, that that's what I'm assuming? Uh, Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the drawback, current. So that's that's a bottleneck at the moment. Right. That's, that's so, right. so do do you see a lot of noise because of these wires? And do you, do you do any processing to avoid the noise? So that depends on uh, what you are trying to record. So, like, let's say if you're measuring heart signals or muscle signals, they're usually high enough. So, like, the noise is not a big issue. What is very uh, problematic is recording electroencephalograms like from your brain. Those mm -hmm. signals are usually small and you would need to pre-amplify that. So oh. one of the research projects we're actually still uh, exploring is uh, if you, okay, hi. So if you get a transistor instead of a, an electrode, uh, you can pre-amplify the signal right away, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so right. That's uh, this. This is this is one uh, possible advantage that you can do, like a, a pos possible research in the future, to preamplify mm -hmm. those signals as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was particularly interested in the last experiment you have showed about the eye. So I was like, yeah. how did you actually capture? Uh, yeah, without those, those signals. Much those signals are pretty high. So those uh, electrooculograms. Those electrooculograms are pretty high in uh, signal amplitudes. So okay. you can see here, they're like 200 microvolts. So that's uh, pretty high considering the noise is like 10 microvolts. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it looks pretty clean, yeah. yeah. Hi, Dimitri. 
um i had a, a kind of general question so uh what what do you think is the research direction that your future lab would take um in terms of uh, would it be more towards bioelectronics neuroelectronics or would it be more towards basic neuroscience and at the same time building tools to understand basic neuroscience so do you have any idea in that regard so i well, i personally would probably not go into basic neuroscience i wouldn't say it's mine definitely not mine uh i, I see my nation more of the applied bioelectronics using all sorts of 2d materials and novel nanomaterials and interfaces okay cool and what do you think of um the uh the general direction of uh 2d materials in applied bioelectronics now that things like um nanoparticles like magnetic nanoparticles and those stuff are also coming into picture so do you think they can be combined to uh give a greater uh prospect or or do you, what's your take on this i mean there are definitely ways to combine things and there are definitely ways to learn from one example to go into some you know different other field so like uh, what i really like uh, for example an idea of neuro dust right so it, was, uh, it has been published uh it's a it's like a it's like a small device that is uh, ultrasound i think ultrasoundly coupled uh and it can perform the measurements while inside your brain and then you can have an, another recorder on top of the skull uh they're still bulky right so they're still uh explore exploring some silicon and hard electronics i think some pzt materials i, I don't want to lie to be honest but uh if the same uh, sort of devices can be done fully by 2D materials, you are really not taking any space, right? So you're literally making an atomically thin, ultra thin implantable dust, like a nano dust, nanoparticles that can be forever in your brain, forever in your body that you can communicate with. That's important. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any any other questions? Okay, if no other questions, thank you so much Dimitri for your for your talk sure. which is thank you. which had many aspects right from 2D materials, bioelectronics, yeah. interdisciplinary research and and many countries where you have <laughs> where you got all your experience in research it was it was enlightening thank you all right thank you